if you know what you want, then you know when you're failing. If you don't allow yourself to know what you want, you can keep that foggy. Um, if you don't set out the conditions for your success, then you can avoid your responsibility because, again, that's not clear. And the problem with wanting something is that in all probability, you're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to make sacrifices. And it's certainly possible that you want to avoid that. Um, you, you, you might be afraid to make it clear because other people could deny it to you too, which is something I write about a fair bit in that chapter. Um, the problem is, and, and failing to make any of that clear protects you right now. But it's really hard on you over the medium to long term. Because if you don't make it clear to yourself what you want or to other people, the probability that you're just going to stumble into it is pretty low. Mm -hmm. and, and you can put that off indefinitely day after day. But the problem with that is that you age while you're doing that. And there's a, obviously a price to be paid for that. So. That chapter, that's chapter three, do not hide things in the fog. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a warning about failing to pay attention. You know, knowledge emerges in a very strange way. It, it emerges, obviously, when we learn something, we started out by not knowing it. And so what that means is that knowledge goes through a transformation process from being absolutely not there to being explicit and fully detailed. And one step of that process is emotion. And so, for example, you might find yourself frustrated, disappointed about the events of the day, but be unable to exactly specify why. That's extremely common. You know, you go home to your partner and you'd be in a bad mood and, you know, you'll snap at them for something and they'll say, well, what's up with you? And you'll say, well, nothing. You're just being annoying when it's perfectly clear to both of you that there is actually something up with you. And then that disappointment and frustration, anger and sadness, let's say, or anxiety is a sign that something isn't right. But it isn't like it isn't necessarily that you're repressing knowledge of what's not right. It's that you just you actually don't know. Mm. And the emotion is the first step in the process by which that knowledge emerges. And you might have to sit and think and talk to your partner or to a friend for God only knows how long before you're actually going to put your finger on what it is that you're upset about. And it could be very far removed from whatever happened to trigger you in the moment. And so that's the fog. And you can keep things in the fog just by not doing that. It's really easy. It's no dip more difficult than just sitting there doing nothing. Because creating knowledge is active and difficult. You know, Attention is the basic currency, right? Everyone fights for it. And it's incredibly valuable. And it, it certainly is the case that it's also very tempting to turn your attention to things that grasp your short-term interest rather than, say, pursuing the causes of negative emotion. That's a, that's a good example. And, of course, we have massive corporations working night and day to continually attract our attention and there's something sinister about that obviously but but <laughs> you can't exactly lay responsibility at their feet because mm -hmm. there isn't that there's a tremendous overlap between educating people informing them and and making them attend to you and and the lines between all of those things are very f foggy let's say and difficult to lay out it's certainly the case that one of the ways that you can keep yourself in a fog about yourself is by distracting, is through distraction with external, uh, with anything in the external world. And obviously computer technology, cell phones, games, well, not negative in and of themselves, perhaps, are there at any moment to oh, yeah. distract you. I think you need a meaning to sustain you in life because life is difficult and so the meaning has to be proportional to the, to the difficulty. I think everyone knows that and wants that. Um, whenever I talk to audiences about that and pointed out that it's through the adoption of responsibility that you're most likely to encounter those meanings, the audiences would generally go silent because that isn't an equation that's often made. 
right? Is that, well, you need meaning. That's better than happiness. Happiness is a consequence, I would say, a fortunate consequence of the pursuit of something deeply meaningful. But almost everything that's deeply meaningful requires the willingness to adopt responsibility. And so that's a good thing to know because you might ask yourself, well, why should I adopt responsibility? And the answer to that seems to be something like, wow. well, it, it deepens your life. You don't want to make your conditions for failure conscious because then you know when you're failing and that hurts. You don't want to um, make your plans for the future too clear because then if you then if you don't attain what you're looking for, it's very clear that you've lost it, which is somewhat different than failure, right? Um, and then there's also the prob problem that if you make your motives clear to other people, then they really have the ammunition to hurt you because mm. like I can hurt you by depriving you of what you want. But I can hurt you even better if I really know what you want and can deprive you of that. So you have reasons to keep these things unclear. But then, and then you, but the problem then is, is that you don't have a, a, a direction that's powerful, right? Because you're not consulting yourself, watching yourself, learning about yourself, figuring out who you are and figuring out what kind of route through life you would have to take to be engaged okay so then you get weak because you're not integrated you're all over the place you're scattered um, well then anybody who is has power for one reason or another can compete with you for your own attention mm. and win and so if you don't have your own plan painful as it is to develop one partly because you have to take your own inadequacies into account Oh, yes. And you also mentioned, you know, you you posit an ideal. This is what I want or this is who I could be. The farther away that is from you, the more inadequate you feel in relationship to it. You know, so that's ah. another reason to avoid it. But yes, well, that's why every ideal is a judge. There's no getting away from that. Now, if it's too much for you, I might say, well, make a lesser ideal, like try to pursue something that doesn't intimidate you into paralysis. What you really want to do is you want to lay out a, a plan that has a, a pretty high end aim, but that also consists of steps that aren't too intimidating. That, that, so you have to ask yourself, um, I would like to do this. Um, I should do it, but would I do it? And the answer is likely to be no, often. Because you know what you're like. You're supposed to go to the gym, but you don't. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, maybe you won't go to the gym, but maybe you'd walk half a block every second day, something like that. And you have to ask yourself, I write about this in the first chapter about the advantage of being a fool. You know, if you notice that you're not so good at something, then you can calibrate down the goal until a fool like you can manage it. Mm -hmm. And then you can attain it. And then you're not quite so much of a fool. Take on some responsibility. Do something for other people. You're doing something for yourself while you're doing that, even if you don't know it, for sure, because you're a community across time. Find, Find somebody, something to serve. Somebody to help. Someone to help. To solve. A job to... Find a job. Do your best with the customers. Don't be above your job. You're going to get an entry-level job when you're a kid. Well, what else would you want? You want to be the boss? What do you know? You don't know anything. You could be the boss of your job. You know, if you're working in a grocery store or you're working in a convenience store, assuming you're not working for terrified tyrants, you can be nice to the customers. You can develop your social skills. You can learn how to handle boss-employee relationship. You can be there 15 minutes early and leave 15 minutes late. Like, you can learn in an entry-level job, man. And I'll tell you, if you take an entry-level job and you learn, and it's a reasonably decent place, you will not be in an entry-level job for long. Because everyone who's competent is desperate for competent people. And if you go and show yourself as competent, there'll be a trial period. But if you go show yourself as competent, all sorts of doors you didn't even know were there will start opening like mad. So you strive for competence, for yeah. craftsmanship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For discipline. You know, I mean, I, I said in one of the chapters in my books is, is, is focused on putting your house in order. It's like, well, how do you start? Make your bed. You know, I, I, it actually took me quite a long time in my life before I made my bed regularly in the morning. Most of my life was in pretty good order, but that was one thing I didn't have in order. My clo clothes in my closet as well, all that's in order. Not all of it. I'm cleaning out some drawers right now, but look around and see what bugs you in your room. Just look. It's like, 
Okay, I'm in my room. Do I like this room? No, it bugs me. Okay, why? Well, the paint's peeling there, and it's dusty there, and the carpet's dirty, and that corner's kind of ugly, and the light there isn't very good, and my clothes closet's a mess, so I don't even like to open it. Um, okay, that's a lot of problems. That sucks. That's a lot of opportunity. Pick something and fix it. Something that bugs you. Yeah, but not too much. So it, the rule is, pick something that you know would make, pick a problem. Pick a solution to it that you know would help, that you could do, that you would do. So you have to negotiate with yourself. It's like, well, I won't clean up this room. How do you know? I've been in here for 10 years and I've never cleaned it up. It's like, well, obviously that's too big a dragon for you. Would you clean one drawer? Find out. And so imagine now you want to be happy when you open that drawer. You think, well, that's stupid. It's like, is it? Maybe it's your sock drawer, which I cleaned up in my room the other day, by the way. You're going to, mo you're going to open that every morning. So that's like 30 seconds of your life every day. Okay, so that's three minutes a week. That's 12 minutes a month. That's two hours a year. So maybe your life is made out of, you've got 16 hours a day. Let's figure this out. Five, 12 in an hour, 12 in an hour, 144 in 12 hours. Yeah, let's say 200. 200 five-minute chunks. That's your life. So you got 200 five-minute chunks. And they repeat. A lot of them repeat. So if you get every one of those right, they're trivial, right? Who cares what my sock drawer looks like? It's like, fair enough, man, but that's your life. The things you repeat every day. The mundane things. Think, I could get all those mundane things right. That's the game rules. It's like now the mundane is in place. Now you can play.